Amen. We thank you for your offering, your gifts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you have something on your heart that you want to share with the Lord, if you just want to have this a conversation, the altar is open. Bring your concerns, your cares, your thanks, your praise. For the altar is open. It's open for all. Gracious Heavenly Father, you have brought us from a long way. So many things we have to deal with, Lord. So many trials, tribulations, so many problems, so many hassles. Sometimes, Lord, we wonder how we made it through the day. But, Lord, you saw fit to have us wake up this morning. You saw it fit, Lord, for us to get in our cars and drive over here. You saw it fit, Lord to wake us up in our right mind. So Heavenly Father, first we say thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we know, Lord, you are a living God and a giving God and a righteous and just God. Heavenly Father, we know we have we have broken your will. We have not done your law. We have been disobedient children, Lord. So Lord, we ask you for forgiveness right now, Lord. Help us, Lord, do better than we've done last week, Lord. Help us, Lord, as we do better than we did yesterday, Lord. Lord, let our light shine. Help us to shine our light to this world, Lord. For this world needs to see the light. So many different things going on. So many different things being said. Some are lies. Some are truth. But all of it just sometimes just hurts, Lord. And, Lord, sometimes we don't know if we can keep on going on, Lord. Sometimes, Lord, we don't know if we have the strength, Lord, to get out of bed this, in the morning. So, Heavenly Father, we just ask you for strength, Lord, to see us through these trying times, to get us through these trials and tribulations, to walk with us, Lord, hold us, guide us, strengthen us, give us wisdom and understanding, Lord. For, Lord, we have many folks who are in the hospital who wanted to come to church, but they cannot get out of bed. We have many people that heard bad reports from the doctor, Lord. But Lord, we know you are the healer, Lord. You are the provider, Lord. And we're not going to worry, Lord. We're going to put it in your hands and say, thank you, Lord, for you got us through, Lord. And Lord, and even though sometimes, Lord, we just have a heavy heart, a heavy heart. We just pray, Lord, for peace and understanding, Lord. So, Lord, for those who are suffering this morning, Lord, we ask, Lord, just to hold on to them. Those who are feeling some pain right now, Lord, hold on to them. Those who are feeling sad, Lord, let them feel your joy, Lord. We know, Lord, joy comes in the morning, Lord. You, Lord, are the Alpha and Omega, the shining sun, our Redeemer and our Provider, Lord. Bless us, Lord, as we continue this journey through life, Lord. Help us, Lord, with any issues that we have, Lord, for you know them all. So, Lord, we're going to say thank you, Lord, because we're going to put these things in your lap and we're not going to worry about them anymore. We're going to say thank you, Lord. And we're going to be happy, Lord. We're going to share our joy. We're going to say, thank you, Lord, for you are a just God and a wise God and an awesome provider, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say, amen, amen.
Yes, you are the risen King seated. First Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 to 13. And I'll be reading from the CEB Bible. Let's begin the reading of his word. If I, if I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong or chasing symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give everything, if I give away everything that I have and over my body to feel good and what I've done but don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up all things, trust in all things, hope for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As for prophecies, they'll be brought to an end. As for tongues, they will stop. As for knowledge, it'll be brought to an end. We know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, what is partial will be brought to an end. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child, reason like a child, think like a child, but now I have become a man. I put an end to childish things. Now we see a reflection in the mirror, then we will see face to face. Now I know partially, but then I will know completely in the same way that I have been completely known. Now faith, hope, and love remain. These three things, and the greatest of these is love. This is my brother and sister's word of God for the people of God. Amen. You may be seated.
make all things new. Yes, you do. And I'm going to follow you. And I'm following you forward. Good morning, Cedar Grove. All right. Well, what a blessing it is to be here in the presence of God, right here in God's house with all of God's people. I'm excited. We have been blessed. Now, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to reread today's scripture, and I'll be reading the NIV version. This is Paul speaking to the people of Corinth. If I speak in tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongdoings. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I taught like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only a reflection as a, in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. Let us pray. Most Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for continuing to come into our presence when we're here, Lord. We can thank you for being there when we're not here. Father, we praise your holy name. Now, Lord, I'm asking that you will give me what I need today in order to deliver this message, Lord. Allow us to hear a word from you this morning, Lord. So now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Amen. My message today is titled, What's Love Got to Do With It? pastor didn't change that <laughs> some of you probably remember Tina Turner belting out in the 90s what's love got to do with it what's love but a second hand emotion what's love got to do with it who needs a heart when a heart can be broken and you know that's a great question but did you just hear Paul addressing the people of Corinth he talked about speaking in tongues Having the gift of prophecy. What a cool gift, huh? Knowing before you know. Gotta be awesome. Having faith that moves mountains. Even giving away all his possessions to the poor. But he followed that with, I am nothing. I gain nothing. And I have nothing if I don't have love. Makes you think that love is pretty important. We're living in a time where there are many inappropriate behaviors in some of our authority figures. Many of their actions, or rather reactions, are a tit-for-tat response to a negative experience. Truly, that is not the answer. It's simply the definition of conflict. As a reminder, he was, ah, Jesus had a lot of negative experiences that he could have assumed a tit-for-tat position. As a reminder, he was accused of breaking the law of Moses. He was falsely accused of blasphemy and treason. 
He was rejected by his own people. He was arrested and unfairly tried. He was denied by Peter. He was betrayed by Judas. He was deserted by his disciples after his arrest. Can you see some opportunities for payback here? But we know that was not how Jesus operated. Today, as we reflect on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we recognize the irony of the song, What's Love Got to Do With It, and his life's mission. We know that Dr. King is considered the foremost leader of the civil rights movement. For those of you who do not recall, this was a nonviolent movement in the United States which fought against, legalized segregation and racial injustice. Think about that. Dr. King mounted an army of believers armed with their faith and their Bibles to battle against a society that had grown accustomed to beating down an entire race of people. I'm certain that if Dr. King were asked the question, what's love got to do with it? He'd probably echo 1 John. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not know, does not love, does not know God, because God is love. Getting back to this nonviolent movement, we can find the six principles of nonviolence in Dr. King's book, The Stride Toward Freedom. Allow me to present these six principles to you, two at a time, utilizing some of Dr. King's favorite quotes and inserting a little scripture to see if we can make a connection to what love has to do with it. The first principle, nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. It is active nonviolent resistance to evil. It is aggressive spiritually, mentally, and emotionally. Principle two, nonviolence seeks to win friendships and understanding. The end result of nonviolence is redemption and reconciliation. The purpose of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. The movement was successful because there was passion in this movement. Dr. King had a dream. He turned his dream into a vision by writing it down. There's power in putting dreams down on paper. When you commit something to writing alone, you make a commitment to achievement that naturally follows. You can't start a fire with paper by itself, but writing something down on paper can start a fire inside of you. Dr. King encouraged his followers to stay prayed up and to continue to respect everyone, including themselves. The dream did not include counterproductive measures, only positive reaffirming actions. God himself followed this word by taking his vision for us and having it put down on paper in the form of the Bible. He did not just rely on the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us. He put his goals down in writing. We're told in Habakkuk 2 to make the word of the Lord plain upon tables, tablets, put it on paper so that it's clear and specific as to what the vision is, so that he may run that readest it. What's love got to do with it? Well, God watches over us and hears our cries, as well as millions of others at the same time. Throughout the Bible, there is evidence of God hearing the cries of his people and responding. The most memorable is when God responded by tasking Moses to lead his people out of Israel. Remember, God loves his people so much that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him shall, have, shall not perish but have everlasting life. That makes it easy to understand why Dr. King's remark, without love, there is no reason to know anyone. For love will, in the end, connect us to our neighbors, our children, and our hearts. He asked that we must accept finite disappointments, but we must never lose infinite hope. Principle number three, nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. 
Nonviolence recognizes that evildoers are also victims and are not evil people. The nonviolent resistor seeks to defeat evil, not people. Principle four, nonviolence holds that suffering can educate and transform. Nonviolent accepts suffering without retaliation. Unearned suffering is redemptive and has tremendous educational and transforming possibilities. This is where forgiveness comes in. Author Thomas Porter declares the following as a list of what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not weakness, but it's an act of great strength. It's not denial of wrongdoing. It's not excusing wrongdoing. It's not condoning wrongdoing. It's not giving up the quest for justice. However, it's important for us to also remember what forgiveness is. It's a journey. It's a choice, a decision that we make. It's primarily a gift that we give to ourselves. It breaks us out of the cycle of violence, revenge, and retribution. It's not reconciliation, but it's the only way to get to reconciliation. Think back to Jacob and Esau. They were twin brothers born to Isaac and Rebekah. And while no one today would choose one child over the other as a favorite, Esau was his dad's favorite and Jacob was his mom's favorite. Esau was born first, and so he was by custom entitled to the birthright, which is an honor given to the firstborn, bestowing head of household status and the right to inherit the father's, th the father's estate. As Genesis 25 tells us, Esau sold his birthright to Jacob, giving it up for a meal because he was hungry. So Esau felt some kind of way about that birthright thing. While that alone is reason enough to have a little tension between the boys, it did not end there. Later, as their dad was nearing the end of his days and his health and eyesight were failing him, he called his, his son Esau to him and said, according to Genesis 27, now then take your weapon, your quiver and your bow and go out in the field and hunt game for me and prepare for me delicious food such as I love and bring it to me so that I may eat and my soul may bless you before I die. So Esau left to do just as his father has requested. Well, as it's written, his mother overheard this conversation and after sharing it with Jacob, directed him to get game from the flock and bring to her so that she could prepare it as the dad liked it and then have Jacob present himself as Esau to Isaac so that Isaac would give the blessing to Jacob. Well, you guys know how that turned out. Isaac blessed Jacob with everything, including dominion over all his mother's sons. And when Esau returned and the realization of the deceit was discovered, Esau had to face the fact that his father did not have another blessing. So Esau hated his brother and vowed that once his father had passed and he properly mourned his dad's death, he would kill his brother Jacob. The wounds were fresh and there was no forgiveness in sight. Hearing this, Rebekah sent Jacob to her brother Laban in Haran to save him from the wrath of his brother, who he had now cheated twice. Now after 20 years, Jacob and his caravan are head toward Canaan and running directly into the path of Esau and his 400 herdsmen. Both men had become prosperous. Jacob, fearing Esau's wrath, broke his wealth into waves and one after the other began sending it as a peace offering ahead of him to his brother. Since the meeting with Esau was imminent and the evening was coming, Jacob went alone to pray. And that's what we find in Genesis 32. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. 
The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome, verses 24 and 28. So as they are continuing the journey, Jacob sees his brother coming with his 400 men. So Jacob gets out in front of his family to be the first to encounter Esau and the consequences of his own actions. My goodness, you know it looked like it was going to be on and popping. But you know we serve an awesome God. The Bible tells us that Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. They wept. After over 20 years of separation, Jacob and Esau embraced, setting aside all their past difficulties, grudges, jealousies, and misdeeds. The two brothers were united under the loving embrace and supervision of the God of their fathers. What's love got to do with it? Luke 6 says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. We're encouraged to endure the long term and look for win-win solutions. According to Dr. King, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. He continues that not only do our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter, but also that forgiveness is not a, an occasional act. It's a constant attitude. 1 John 4 says, whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Now our last two principles. Number five, nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. It resists violence of the spirit as well as the body. Nonviolent love is spontaneous, unmotivated, unselfish, and creative. Principle six, nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice. The nonviolent resistor has a deep faith that justice will eventually win. Nonviolence believes that God is a God of justice. We're presented daily with numerous opportunities to choose love instead of hate. We're in the midst of uncertain times and many times find it easy to abandon showing love and compassion to those with whom we disagree or are responsible for acts that cause us harm. But like David, we need to keep our trust and faith in God and know that what God has for us, it is for us. David was the youngest of seven sons. He was anointed as a child to be the next king. But he did not become king until he was 30. In the interim, he defeated Goliath with a slingshot and a stone. He became Saul's, the king, armor bearer, playing the lyre whenever the king felt the presence of evil spirits. He also became one of the leaders of Saul's army. So you'd think that this is going to be a great transition you know, just right behind Saul, get tutelage and that kind of stuff? Not at all. Once, when David and the troops were returning from a mission, the women were dancing and singing as they did from time to time. Saul is slain his thousands, and David is tens of thousands. First Samuel 18 says Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They credited David with tens of thousands, he thought. But me with only thousands? What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Saul was jealous, suspicious, and took efforts to eliminate David. But David never wavered. He kept his faith in God. 
listen closely for God's direction and was able to escape from Saul's grasp before eventually claiming the throne. His actions are clear evidence of his ability to use power carefully and claim our legacy. According to Dr. King, not only is the time always right to do what is right, but he also says that love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Dr. King reminds us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. I believe it's important to remember that at the core of the movement and in the midst of all the conflict, Dr. King remained a peace builder. He continued to rely on God's power, recognizing the log in his own eye, but not bringing a spirit of judgment to the people he was working with. We know that we only know in part and see things like all human beings in a mirror dimly. And as a peace builder, Dr. King knew that in order to get a seat at the table and be able to affect the changes that were so desperately needed, he had to let go of striving for control, develop a relationship of trust and respect, bring a sense of gratitude and abundance to the process, express humility, and ultimately be a resource to others. What's love got to do with it? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? According to Dr. Martin Luther King, love is the most durable power in the world. We are in community, even with our enemies. Jesus said that to love God supremely is the first and greatest commandment. It is first and greatest in that it represents the heartbeat of every other commandment. That's why when Jesus spoke to the disciples during the Sermon on the Mount, he told them, don't react violently against one who is evil. Instead, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. 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 Before I open the doors of the church, I want to explain what happened. What happened here was done for one purpose, but it served another purpose altogether. And there are times when, you ever had the time when you plan something and God uses it for something else? Whether you knew it or not, you just witnessed it here. Something else was planned, and God used it for something else. We serve an awesome God. Please remember that. Let the church say amen again. Amen. Let us stand and we open the doors of the church. And if you have found a church home, I invite you now to come up. For the time is your time right now. You don't have to wait for tomorrow. You have to wait for the next week, the next month, either next year. Your time is now. Praise team, thank you very much. Our musicians, our sound. Guys, ladies, thank you very much. And our speaker this morning. Right now was that time. In more ways than you could ever know right now. Right now was that time. And I want to thank each and every one of you for being here this Sunday morning on Martin Luther King Day. As the act like come, we can bring out the light of Christ to the world.